Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all here. I know that some of you were at the party last night. I heard it was very good. It went on quite late. So if you were and you've managed to come this morning, an extra wonderful welcome to you. As already mentioned by Shivani, we have here, of course, uh, the Minister of the Economy, France Bayot. Welcome to you. You are also Luxembourg Minister for Development, Corporation, Humanitarian Affairs. Lovely to see you again here at the Arch Summit. And uh, up at 4 a.m., just flown in from London, very, very happy to welcome you here, Joachim Reiter, who is the Chief External and Corporate Affairs Officer at Vodafone, and also spent time at the UN Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy SG of UN Conference on Trade and Development. So wonderful to have you flying in here from London as well. Now we're going to um, start, I'm going to start with you, Joachim. We all know what the world situation is like right now. You have experience at the UN, you're now at Vodafone. Um, I mean, we have two roles here. We've got the role of government and we've got the role of business. So let's start with the role of business. What can be done from Vodafone's point of view or all of the people here who are perhaps a co-partner to help in this geopolitical situation? Yeah, we're in a, we're in a pretty dire situation, if I can put it bluntly, uh, and I think uh, the minister probably would agree that in my lifespan, I don't think we've been in as volatile situation as this. If you think about it, we're dealing with multiple crises. The simple truth about it is that the business is not going to be able to navigate through this alone, and neither is governments. So we sort of sink or float together in this situation, which is a, probably a new situation for both of us. The good news is that in COVID, together with governments, that was the recipe of success. If you look at how the pharmaceutical companies, for example, work with government on developing the vaccines, or in the telecom sector, how we came together and connected and maintained connectivity, thereby allowing everyone to still continue to work and stuff like that. So, it's, so at this point in time, I think we have to put our traditional roles aside, come together as one, and figure out in our division of labor, how do we overcome the situation? And for me, there are three things that are absolutely we have to solve in this situation. Number one, we're in a in a situation where we may uh, have irreparable damage to European competitiveness. By the way, that's true in Africa as well. Number two, we have a green transition that we simply do not know how to drive with the level of ruthlessness that is required because we have to transform entire societal systems. And number three, in the new geopolitical world we live in, every country will have to start thinking differently around its dependencies, its resilience, and its support and protection of citizens. And in all those three areas, I don't think government has the answer, but neither do business. So we are gonna have to come together and figure it out. Well, I'm turning to uh, the representative of the Luxembourg government here, Minister Fayo. You are having conversations, I'm sure, about this every single day, and not just within Luxembourg, but also on a European, if not global level. So can you share some of those ideas with us? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually, as I was saying yesterday in my, uh, in my uh, introduction, my keynote speech, it's um, uh, very challenging times. Um, and um, we are uh, in, in this uh, context of uh, multiple crises uh, happening at the same time, uh, coming out of a, of, out of a pandemic, uh, now faced with this uh, terrible war with very high inflation that we hadn't, haven't seen since the 1980s, um, all that against the backdrop, backdrop of a climate crisis that is um, accelerating loss of biodiversity. Um, and um, having to understand how we, how, we, how we navigate that, how we stabilize uh, our uh, societies uh, uh, to start with. Uh, and we had this tripartite uh, discussion in September in Luxembourg where we decided to, uh, to um, um, basically put a ceiling on, on energy prices to basically support uh, households in, in coming over this, uh, uh, this, this energy crisis and, and um, uh, purchasing power crisis, and at the same time also um, save our businesses, because I very much agree with what Joachim said. We need to uh, make sure that, uh, as Europeans, we still have businesses coming out of this, um, out of this crisis, um, and uh, at the same time help them to, um, to, do, to get through this uh, transition. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the energy transition, the greening of our economies, uh, decarbonizing our economies, which is an absolute imperative. Um, it's 
facts are very stubborn, science is stubborn, we are, um, the planet is, is on the verge of collapsing, there are tipping points that are being, uh, that are being reached and, and, and uh, that, are, that are also uh, yeah, tipped huh, uh, with, uh, with d disastrous consequences. So I think all of, the, all of that is um, the challenges, are the challenges we are facing and I, I very much agree, we have to work hand in hand, we have to do this governments, uh, with businesses, also with, of course, uh, multinational organizations like the UN and, uh, and mm -hmm. others, um, uh, all, all together. And nobody has a silver bullet uh, in all of this. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we, but we have a lot of solutions, technological solutions. But I, I'm afraid we also will have to think about how we, how we live and how we produce, uh, in particular in, in very developed societies like here in Luxembourg. Well, I want to move on to some technological solutions and move towards solutions because we're talking to a crowd here, a very tech-savvy crowd. And Joachim, turning to you then, when it comes to digitalizing Europe, of course you will have worked on this with your time in the UN as well. It's something that's spoken about, one of the pillars that the UN is working towards to make sure everybody's keeping up. And let's think about Europe. So from Vodafone's point of view, or if you have any words of wisdom, Solution-wise, what can technology do right now? Um, well, first, you need to understand Europe's starting point, and I think there is a, a degree of arrogance in Europe, believing somehow that we are still leading technological advancement. And, and this conference is a great illustration of bringing know-how, innovations, and inspirations from all parts around the globe, because Europe is no longer in pole position, and we have a long way uh, to get back to pole position, to be frank. I think from, from my point of view, the, the few things uh, which we're at the cusp of fully exploiting, where we have a huge potential, I have an enormous amount of optimism if we get it right, but I think my challenge is, do we have the courage to rethink our current business model and governmental models to achieve it? Number one is, of course, we're, we're at the cusp of a hyper-connected world enabled by 5G. And here, the starting point for Europe is that we run the risk of becoming almost 10 years behind China in 5G, the real 5G. Uh, so we're far behind China at this point. Why is that? I mean, the basic problem is, um, if I had to be honest, is that Europe probably rested on its laurels in not trying to understand the lack of incentive, private investment. In the end, the 5G is a private investment cycle. And unless you understand what, what are the conditions that allow companies to deploy 5G at pace, you're going to miss the boat. And unfortunately, the Europe, despite having led the 3G revolution, remember, lost the 4G revolution to the Americans, and now we're losing the 5G revolution to China. And I think that should be a wake-up call, from a, not only from a point of view of my industry, but from the point of view of the entire society. Because that's an enabling general purpose technology that will lift all boats. You will revolutionize productivity in manufacturing. The way you will run a beer factory tomorrow will be different because of 5G. So it it's sort of uh, permeates all aspects of society. So there's a big question around, can we put ourselves into a fast track of catching up in that space? But just pausing on that point, this also could be fixed if there was more cooperation with China, you mentioned, as, as one of the leading markets in 5G. But for political reasons, there isn't entire cooperation, perhaps, with the Chinese markets. I'm turning to you for a potential answer here. I mean, if, if Europe was to... Do I have... Do I have a, there was this French TV show where you had a joker where you could not respond to one question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, 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 have, you have that choice, of course. Okay, I'll turn to you then. You <laughs> there is an option to cooperate, and I know from time in the UK that uh, at one point the UK press were talking about not taking on board one company, which I won't name, um, because there was fear. And when it comes to 5G in general, there is also fear amongst, let's say in inverted brackets, the general public. Yeah. So, so there's a lot more than just we're behind in Europe. Yeah, I mean... Uh Okay, so I, unfortunately, I don't have that card. I, you never get that in the corporate world. <laughs> uh, secondly, I, uh, for whatever reason, when we talk about this issue, I always come to think about the run DMC. It's tricky. Uh, and and, and um, <laughs> Catch-all answer so, uh, for everything. For, for, let me just make a few points. Number one, of course, it's the sovereign right of every government to figure out where they stand on security. And as Vodafone, we don't question that. But what we are saying is, number one, you need to be fact-based. Work through the facts. 
not all elements of the network are equally sensitive. So if you want to have a risk-based approach, and that, that is your sovereign choice, how much risk you want to tolerate, you just need to think through which are the parts of the network that you would then uh, want to protect, for example, from, from if you deem that there is a risk of using a particular vendor. Uh, so that's number one. Second thing you need, absolutely need to do is if you're serious about security, don't reduce it down to a question around a single vendor or, for that matter, about network architecture. You know, we have a huge security problem in Europe that goes way beyond network architecture or network vendor selection, starting with cyber. You know, most of the cyber attacks has nothing to do with the type of hardware or software you put in. Frankly, there are a number of governments that are fantastically capable and private players to hack into any system. We need to have a security stance in Europe that is uh, based on an end-to-end understanding around vulnerabilities. And Vodafone is super committed, and we constantly work with governments to try to help them, give them the full information on what can we do, where can we provide capabilities to protect countries, understand government's security stance, and then work with them how would you implement that in a risk-based way, and finally, we need to have much better certification. I mean, the way I see it, I don't come from telco, right? My background is not telco, but I arrived into telco from having worked on manufacturing industry. I mean, you would never be able to put a car out with that it hasn't type approval. Type approval is basically standards and certification and conformity assessment. But the reality is we do not have standards, certification and conformity assessment for most tech. But that takes time, and we're, we're moving in a world of tech that the, the speed, and we saw it with COVID, I mean, you can make the parallel with the pharmaceutical world. You have to put things out quicker than perhaps the certification. Certification and regulation can slow things down. I do want to bring you back in, Minister Fayyad, because I think you might want to talk about cybersecurity, because I know it's one of the pillars here in Luxembourg yeah. that you're working very hard on. Yes, I think, <clears throat> just maybe to still answer in some, some way to, what you, to your previous question, I think the challenge for us as, as Europeans, and indeed we have fallen behind in this, uh, in this race, but the challenge for us is to do, uh, to do this all um, on, on the value, with a value-based approach. Mm. Um, a lot has been said about uh, the GDPR, about data protection, uh, um, but that is, that is a choice. And I mean, European, uh, European societies, uh, Euro European countries, uh, share values. Uh, the European Union is a value-based um, um, union, um, and privacy is one of these very important values that, that we have, and that explains uh, data protection. It explains why we now have the DMA and the DSA, which, which is also aiming to uh, somehow um, frame these, these uh, sometimes abusive um, uh, be behaviors on, of uh, big uh, tech platforms. Um, and we have to uh, we, we have to, to to work with with these with these values, and I think that's that's the big challenge going forward. Uh, and indeed, I think cybersecurity is one of them. It's fighting crime that is taking place. Uh, the more you connect things, the more you are exposed, of course, to cybersecurity. It's a very strong strong backbone we are developing here here in in Luxembourg. But I would say overall, what is um, I think what may have been a, a disadvantage, competitive disadvantage in the past. Uh, I th I'm convinced will tomorrow be, uh, be an advantage. I think people will, will, will wake up to the fact that a lot of these models, and 5G uh, is also one, one of these uh, things, uh, is, uh, is about collecting data. It's what some call uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, and I think people are faced with the question, do we, do we really want that? And, and to what extent uh, do we want that? And I think this will, in the next years, I'm convinced, uh, be a... Be, be a uh, competitive advantage rather than, than a disadvantage uh, for, for Europeans. But I, I agree, we, we should not be, uh, we, we, sh we need to be aware of this race that is going on and, and, and play our cards to, to, to the best uh, possible. C can I build and so both agree and disagree? Because I think this is a really important conversation to have in Europe around values. I 100% agree that, for example, if you take the GDPR, the idea that we would somehow um, enable a data economy without asking ourselves how do we protect the privacy of citizens would fundamentally undermine the trust in the data economy and therefore the adoption rate would go down. So, so as Vodafone and me personally, I actually think of, we have to build those uh, quadrails 
to make sure that people are comfortable in embracing technology. Otherwise, people will not embrace technology. Well, I think that depends but, on the culture you're from. Yes, but in Europe, I'm talking about Europe. Yeah. The problem I have with the values is no one talks about a European value of being free market or innovation. Why is that not European values? We have a very much in Europe gotten used to applying, trying to be world champions in regulation and standards. We should be world champions also in incentivizing good behaviors and stimulating innovation. So how can that change then? Because sitting within Europe here in Luxembourg where we have a few of the European institutions based right here. Some people might say that the bureaucracy, and when you mentioned certification regulation, all I can think of is a slowing down process, and yet you want to keep up with America and China, the other side is the two major competitors, let's say, in speed. So what can be done to fix that? So if you ask me, for example, take the concrete, let's make it very concrete. GDPR is nothing wrong with GDPR. It's perfectly legitimate and it will improve innovation. However, not if you have 27 member states all interpreting it differently. Europe has allowed, still today, data protection agencies to have different inspections in Germany compared to Luxembourg, compared to Netherlands, compared to Ireland. So you That's think there should be a federal Europe? You need to have, you have one regulation, you have one interpretation. As a business, we cannot navigate in 27 different jurisdictions. It's impossible. Then Europe loses scale, and therefore Europe slows down. I completely agree with that. I think it's a very important point. And we don't know, we, I don't think we need a, a federal uh, Europe, uh, although I'm, I'm all for more uh, European integration, but what we need, uh, first of all, is, is a functioning uh, um, uh, internal market. Yeah. And there, are, there, are, there is right now um, a lot of fragmentation due to a um, um, not well enough functioning internal market. That's why you have these uh, uh, 27 different rules that you have to navigate very often in, in markets which are supposedly uh, harmonized and where you have mutual recognition, but it's just not working the way it should. And that's, uh, that, I think, is a big um, uh, impediment uh, to innovation and, and also to, in particular, small and medium businesses uh, being able to, uh, to, to use this uh, the internal, internal market, which is, I think, one of the, the really big assets of the, uh, of the European uh, Union. Um, it's, it's a, so that's also why when you introduce these regulations, um, the big players don't have a problem with that. They have an army of, uh, of lawyers and of, uh, who, can, who can very well integrate all of that. And, uh, but, but it's not the same for small businesses, for startups, who, who, are, who are basically then blocked from, from accessing this, uh, this huge resource. So it's, it's, bas it's really about um, integration of the market, better functioning internal markets, and then, of course, also uh, yeah, promoting innovation at, uh, with all the instruments we have. Well, we are down to our last few minutes. So, Joachim, I want you to give a call out to our audience here present and anybody who might look at the video later as well. With your few moments left, what would you like to see done to help Europe? And I know we haven't even moved on to Africa and various other continents, but let's stick with Europe because that's been the focus of this conversation. What can be done to improve things? Hmm. Uh, so I'll, I'll broaden it to Africa because we, we, it's, it's a pity not to do that. I mean, we okay, just, let's hop to uh, Africa. No, 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 I'll, I'll broaden it because it's not, so di it's not so different, actually, if you, take a, if you just take a step back. We have to recognize that if you look at this multitude of crises that Francis referred to and, 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 and I completely agree with, um, <clears throat> unless we mobilize all available tools with the same mindset we have during COVID, which was parking our traditional roles, but more importantly also, finding new ways of collaboration and having the courage to do the unthinkable. If you think about lockdowns, and I wasn't a big fan of being locked up with my kids, uh, it, it was a breaking of taboos in society. There was an unimaginable thing that you would constrain people's freedom of movement. But the level of mobilization of society behind the ability to overcome a challenge is the key for us. We have the tools available, we have the technology, to address food security, to solve the fertilizer crisis in Europe, to, to transfer over to renewable energy. All of that is available, provided we have utilized A, the tools, B, collaborate differently, and C, have political courage that are far more than we have ever used before. So I would encourage everyone to think new. I, I, I come from the Berlin Wall fall degeneration. We just got this sense there's something out there, right? something has opened up. It was certainly imaginable that you could cross over to the East. We need to get that mindset back. We are at the, at the 
tipping point in Africa and Europe, how do we lean into it? How do we have the courage to grab it? Well, when you say yeah. that, very sadly for me, all I can think about is that we're collapsing back to that in parts of Eastern Europe right now. And uh, so we're mm. coming full circle to the beginning of our conversation, the geopolitical situation. So I know that with your role, you must have so much on your plate coming from very many avenues. But for yeah, our I, Luxembourg I, focus. I think just also very shortly, because I see we, we are in the red. Um, it's okay. They have a three-hour lunch break, I've been told. Right. <laughs> so... I think it's, it's true, it's, uh, we, we now know that uh, 1990 uh, fall of the Berlin Wall was, was not the end of history, no. um, far from it. Uh, and we are now at this point where we have to, uh, as Europeans, understand that um, all, the, all the countries in the European Union uh, have to understand their sovereign, sovereign, sovereignty as, as a European sovereignty. It's not hard for me to say that as Luxembourg, a very small country, I think Sweden, even the big countries, Germany, France, it's the same, it's the same story. So I think we now need to make this huge effort uh, to uh, develop Europe in, in the direction of a decarbonized, um, carbon neutral um, society in an inclusive way, not losing our populations, not losing the democratic discussion on the way, um, and um, doing it also for the sake of uh, future generations, understanding that the, the solutions are not only technological, I think a lot will go through sobriety, through changing the ways we consume, uh, probably much less, more intelligently, better products, uh, the way we produce in a much more circular, environment-minded way, um, and, and so that will require a huge effort. Uh, next gen EU was, I think, the blueprint for that, but we need mm. to, to demultiply that. And at the same time, uh, and that's the bridge to Africa, we also need to do, to do the same in Africa. Yeah. Uh, Africa our, is our neighbor. We see that climate change is uh, hitting much, much w harder and worse there, while they are absolutely not at fault, and emissions have been caused. In the, in the Northern Hemisphere, so, so there's a great injustice involved there as well. Post-colonial uh, colonial past, I don't have to dwell into that, but to, so we have a debt uh, towards uh, Africa, towards the developing world, uh, and we have to do that, that effort as well. So I think it's a double Marshall Plan that we probably have to do in Europe, uh, but also uh, in the Global South. Well, as you pointed out, we are in the red. Not that I was paying much attention to that. Minister Joachim, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully you can stay for a few minutes more to talk with all of the technology experts here today. I don't think we have any solutions, but at least we've engendered a, another part of the conversation that's ongoing throughout Europe and, of course, the world with so many problems. And hopefully some of you can begin to fix them. Thank you very much.